Thanks for watching this clip from my new podcast, In Search of Soil. For more great clips and full episodes, check out the links in the description below. Thinking about this perennial ground cover in a vegetable type system, what types of plants come to mind? I've thought a lot about this. You need something low lying. You probably want it to provide several functions. Maybe it fixes nitrogen or it's a pollinator or something like that. What are crops that you've heard of or that you can think of that come to mind when you think about a perennial ground cover in a vegetable based system? Um, we have a whole list of those different plants on the website, just because I can't remember them all. Sure. Um, you know, I go out in my backyard and I've got like 10 different kinds of cover plants for where I'm growing tomatoes and potatoes or um, celery or lettuce, um, really good match for those kinds of plants. If you really wanna grow at, um, the brassica, and most a lot of people do, brassica, cold kale crops, um, you want to be pushing actinobacteria in that soil. So in your compost, you want to always develop that actinobacteria community. That's what prevents the mycorrhizal fungi from attacking those root systems of the brassicas. So um, if you want to have perennial understory plants, you want to go towards the creeping thyme, the um, creeping lavender. That's uh, There's a whole slew of of short, low-growing things that have very woody stems, and that's usually a good giveaway. So go to your seed catalogs and start paying attention to how tall do these plants actually grow. And Dutch white clover works really great when we're dealing with the um, tomatoes, potatoes, um, celery, those sorts of things. Um, but the other clovers have driven me crazy um, you know, I bought the mini clover that wasn't supposed to grow more than two inches. Well, in my garden, under my conditions, those clovers grow to a foot and a half. <laughs> right. So if you've got a good, healthy soil, look out for the claims about, yes, this is a mini clover. It only grows this tall. Um, we tried micro clover. We've tried all the different kinds of clovers. Got it. They're fine under big, tall trees and shrubs, but you grow anything that's going to be shorter, no, it's not a good match. I, I remember where we grew um, a row of beets, and uh, we had, had uh, clover as the understory plant, so we dug out a big space around each one of those beet plants that we put in, so it must have been you know, eight inches across, and we figured... Okay, we've got the clover beat back. It shouldn't, there should be no problem. We'll be back on Monday to see how things are going. So we left and we could see every single clover. We got back on Monday. We couldn't find the beets. Just swallowed the up. The beet swallowed up, just covered by a layer of clover. And so now you have to dig in there and try not to rip up the beets while you're trying to rip out the clover. And just not worth the time and effort. Uh, dichondra is another really good one for most vegetable crops. Uh, dichondra typically doesn't get much taller than a couple of inches, and the root systems go nice and deep down into the soil. Um, pretty aggressive. They don't usually allow anything to grow and take over them. You know, grasses are about the only thing that, yeah, on occasion you have to gonna gonna come in and want to pull out a couple of the grass plants that are starting to grow real tall. But otherwise, dichondra works really well. So this is kind of headline material. I think it's an eye catcher, it's clickbaity, and it's a mind blower for some people. But do you think that if you got your soil in balance, microbially, biologically, that you could dramatically decrease weed pressure and potentially never or rarely see weeds in that soil again unless the soil was damaged. It would be a very rare thing. And then those weeds would be the things that would be sick and unhappy and unhealthy. And they often won't flower. They often aren't going to go through a reproductive stage. If you do see them reproducing, it's certainly easy enough to pull off the flowers. 
Um, so on rare occasions, we'll we'll find there was a bear patch or something. A mouse came in and had to dig up something. It buried something. And a squirrel came and right. buried an acorn. Or oh, okay, so we get the occasional weeds, but it's certainly not like something that you're going to have to come in and and deal with or walk down the row with your weed eater and just cut off the tops of the weeds that are growing above your cover crop. I love the idea of the perennial ground cover. And if you had to choose between keeping a perennial ground cover in place and adding compost to supplement the soil from the top, which one would you choose? Obviously, the perennial ground cover has some advantages, like it's less work. You plant it once and it keeps working forever underneath the ground. But there's also some types of plants and commercial crops that a perennial ground cover would be cumbersome with. So could you mimic the perennial ground cover with something like compost teas if you couldn't have a perennial ground cover at the same time as a cash crop, just given how these crops grow? Yeah, and and it's got to be a decision on the part of the person who owns the garden, who owns that soil, that land. Which one do you feel more comfortable doing? And I, of course, being a a lazy gardener, I want to do as little work as possible. I'd much rather go swimming for the whole entire summer than be, you know, pulling weeds out. So I'm always going to pick the permanent cover so that there's not a lot of work there for me to do. But if that's not somebody's choice that, you know, they, oh, it's too difficult trying to figure out all the combinations. Well, then putting down the compost as a mulch That's a really good way to suppress all of those weeds. Just make sure it's a thick enough layer. And then you've got to monitor it because a lot of times the weather conditions are such that that thick, nice thick layer of mulch is going to almost disappear within, you know, two or three weeks and it's gone and you've lost your disease suppressive layer. So, you know, get back out there and put the mulch on again. Uh, Put out the compost teas, the compost extracts. Teas typically go on the foliage where you might, certainly if in the past you've had a problem with a disease or a pest of some kind, protect the above ground part of your plant um, so that um, there's no surface that that disease or pest organism can attack. Um, So they'll go someplace else. They won't even recognize that your um, favorite crop is down there, they're going to go elsewhere because those insects home in on the um, compounds that are released by sick and an unhealthy plant. Uh, Insects are looking for something that's not doing well. And so I've always thought of those insects as being, or those disease-causing fungi, as being messages from uh, Mother Nature about there's something wrong with the plant. There's something wrong with the soil. It's not getting the nutrition. It's not getting the protective compounds. So pay attention. And if you don't pay attention, Mother Nature is going to take a bigger amount of your plants next year. And the year after, it's going to be the whole acre. And the year after that, well, you can grow something else for the next period of time because you're not paying attention to what nature is trying to tell you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.